Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Press Club of Australia. In today's Westpac address, my name is Sabra Lane. I am the club's president. I'm also the presenter of the ABC radio program, AM. Today's guest is the leader of the Australian Greens, Adam Bant, making his first solo appearance here at the National Press Club. If you are following online, you can find us on Twitter. Our user handle is at Press Club, A-U-S-T. Everybody, please join me in welcoming Adam Bant. Thanks very much, Sabra. Um, this is my first solo appearance. Last time I was here was with Bob Catter, and this is much better. Um, so thank you very much. I want to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people on whose land we meet today and acknowledge Elders past, present and emerging. And I also want to acknowledge our newest Senator, Lydia Thorpe, who was sworn in last week and who will bring fresh energy and a fierce determination into the Senate. She said loud and clear that the priority of restoring relations between our First Nations and settlers has to be a treaty and that recognition of sovereignty was never given away. We are the only English colonial country that doesn't have some form of treaty and recognition of ongoing sovereignty, and this can't continue. There remains widespread racism in this country. It's sometimes openly promoted in our media, but it's also quietly accepted and reinforced in our political decisions. It shows itself in our offshore detention policies, our isolated position alongside Trump in foreign affairs and our failure to respond to black deaths in custody. And I want to say clearly and for the record that I believe black lives matter and that the Greens believe black lives matter. When I became leader of the Greens, I said that we were facing three crises, the climate crisis, an inequality crisis and a jobs crisis. I also said the answer to all three is a Green New Deal, a government-led plan of investment and action that creates secure jobs by investing in a clean economy and making Australia more equal, including by getting dental into Medicare, making public schools genuinely free, and a renewable energy grid to power our country, process our metals, and export our sunlight as well. And now, as we start to emerge out of a pandemic that has seen the rich get richer, more than ever we need a great equaliser of public investment to transform our economy and our society. After a promising start of free childcare and real support for those out of work through JobSeeker and JobKeeper, the Coalition has reverted to type with cuts to these programs and a budget that will increase inequality and pull us deeper into a climate catastrophe. And tragically, Labor last week supported most of it. If you look at what they did and how they voted, rather than what they said in their speeches, last week was not a clash of ideas, but Labor and Liberal together fast-tracking billions of dollars to millionaires and big corporations, prolonging the recession and laying revenue-side booby traps for future governments. And that's why we desperately need an alternative vision for the country and a plan for the future that is a genuine alternative to neoliberalism. And today, in discussing the Greens' response to the budget, I also want to talk to you about the next plank in our Green New Deal plan, the unwinding of privatisation. But more on that later. It seems like a while, but it seems like forever ago, but less than 12 months ago, our country was actively debating the government's failure to act on the climate crisis. At the time, the Greens pointed out that Scott Morrison had done everything in his power to make last summer's bushfires worse and should bear his share of the blame for the country's terrible losses. And since then, we've all had to drop everything to deal with the immediate threat of the COVID crisis and the pandemic. And the Greens have been consistent backers of an immediate health-first response to the virus, including pushing very early for upgrades to intensive care and for public investment in vaccine development. And faced with a, with a repeat of the Prime Minister's bushfire debacle as he went off to the NRL during the first wave, we joined with experts and state premiers in pushing the Morrison government to take the pandemic seriously. But while we've all been battling the pandemic, the climate crisis has gotten dramatically worse and Australia's pollution from gas drilling is rising. The COVID crisis is a disaster, but the growing climate crisis will be far, far worse. 
What the pandemic has shown us, though, is that if we act with urgency on the advice of experts, we can save lives and avoid unimaginable damage. But the evidence of the escalating climate crisis emerges daily. And here is just one example. Last month, a 110 square kilometre sized chunk of ice broke off from Greenland. And in the Antarctic, a crucial Britain size hinge is melting so quickly that it may soon collapse. Now, this glacier alone would lead to sea level rises of half a metre just from this hinge, this glacier. But scientists call it the Doomsday Glacier because of how much ice it holds in place. If this glacier goes, the rest of the West Antarctic ice sheet could go, causing an irreversible three metre sea level rise, all during the lifetime of today's primary school students. And I lie awake at night, many nights, wondering what this means for my children. My daughter told me last week that she's going to have seven children and be an astronaut, a ballerina, a teacher and a mum when she grows up. Distressingly, though, an increasingly more plausible prospect <clears throat> is that when she hits 30, cities might be going underwater and large parts of the planet will be becoming uninhabitable. And the process may be irreversible by that point. And I just don't see how my daughters or anyone else survives to live a good life. And that tears me up inside. And that is why we are in a climate emergency. And that's why the government's actions over the last few weeks, including with this budget, are criminal. The government has been advised by the Bureau of Meteorology that Australia is on track for 4.4 degrees of warming under their current targets. And as a result, some scientists warn that on the current pathway, we will face a future world unable to sustain more than half of the current global population. This is a terrifying catastrophe, and it could lead to civilizational collapse during the lifetime of Australia's primary school students today. Scott Morrison's Paris targets mean 95% of irrigation farmers in the Murray-Darling Basin will be forced to leave or go bankrupt. Northern Australia will be uninhabitable from oppressive monsoonal heat and southern Australia will watch as the desert sprawls outwards. Instead of arguing about whether the Liberals will meet their 2030 targets, we should be pointing out what will happen even if they do. Currently, Australia's carbon budget will be blown by 2028. Delay is now the new denial. And Labor is aiding and abetting these climate criminals by abandoning 2030 targets, taking short-term action off the political table and letting Morrison off the hook. Giving people false hope that we don't have to act urgently is in many ways far more dangerous than outright climate denial. Now, I desperately want to turf out this government. And during budget week, Labor should have been with us fighting the government for climate action, for a green recovery. But instead, they backed in a budget that is all brown and trickle down, including the PM's gas rush. My plea to you in the press gallery is not to let the two establishment parties set the parameters of the climate debate by arguing over 2050 targets. The most important thing for reporting on the politics of climate is to follow the science about the necessity for action in the next 10 years, the critical decade. Because otherwise, we pass tipping points. The facts are, anything less for Australia than a 75% reduction by 2030 is simply not consistent with the Paris Agreement goal of limiting global warming to one and a half degrees. And anything less than 48% from now or 49% from after the next election is inconsistent with two degrees. If anyone has a target of less than 49% reduction by 2030, they are giving up on the Paris Agreement. Scott Morrison and Anthony Albanese's climate targets, paid for and set by $9.3 million in donations from the coal, oil and gas industry, will have us pass these tipping points, making global heating an unstoppable chain reaction. Currently, we're heading towards a cliff at 200 kilometres an hour. The Liberals want us to slow down to 180 kilometres an hour before we go over the edge, and Labor is arguing whether it should maybe be 150. In an emergency, you put your foot on the brake and you go off in a different direction. And this is the critical point. You do it before you reach the cliff edge. By 2050, it will be too late. 
everyone ultimately reaches zero when you hit the bottom. Now, last week's budget should have been an opportunity to change direction and put in place a green recovery. The government could have followed Conservative Boris Johnson's lead in Britain, who's planning to power Britain's homes with wind energy, or look to Europe or South Korea, who are putting in place a green deal. And instead, we've been served up with another trickle-down trifecta of tax cuts skewed to the wealthy, massive corporate welfare, and a plan for high unemployment and stagnating wages for the next decade. Half of the so-called tax cuts for people on low incomes are not even real tax cuts but a one-year only deal, a temporary extension of a tax offset for another year, while wealthy Australians, including people earning a million dollars a year, get twice as much in a permanent cut to tax. Meanwhile, stage three tax cuts remain legislated, voted for by Liberal and Labor, giving massive cuts to the super wealthy. These measures are all about winning the next election and not, as economists have pointed out, the best or fairest way to stimulate the economy or set us up for the future. Now, we know that this budget is built on a house of cards with unbelievable assumptions. But even if you are willing to accept the government's estimates, we are looking at more than 6% unemployment for years. That's at least 2 million people without enough work. This means our recovery is going to be slower than both the 1980s and the 1990s recession. Business profit share of income is at its highest in 60 years. And the share of workers' wages are at their lowest. And now the government is also choosing another decade of zero wage growth. Before the recession, the Reserve Bank said 4.5% unemployment was needed to spark wage rises. The Treasurer's 6% unemployment plan is also a plan to keep wages low and let big business pocket the windfall. And this, the most important budget of a generation, has screwed over the next generation. Instead of a proper jobs guarantee, as we proposed in April, the government's youth hiring credit plan will push young people into low-wage, insecure jobs. It will not create the jobs the government claims. This is just another transfer of public money to their corporate mates. This is a subsidy for McDonald's. Instead of giving young people decent jobs on nation-building projects that tackle the climate crisis and make Australia a more creative and caring place. But persistent unemployment and insecure work are not beyond our control. The Treasurer and the Prime Minister are deliberately choosing high unemployment and underemployment. With this budget and its commitment to debt, they could have chosen government-led investment to create jobs and boost aggregate demand, to drive unemployment down to a level of our choosing and create secure, well-paid jobs. But instead, Liberal and Labor have us going into debt to give millionaires a tax cut and McDonald's a handout. As someone who spent years representing low-paid workers before getting elected to Parliament, I know the damage done by insecure work. Under my leadership, the Greens will be a party that champions full employment and wage increases, which means we will fight for 2% unemployment rate, like it was on average between World War II and the 1970s, as well as 2% underemployment. And the Greens' comprehensive Invest to Recover plan which I released in April and which we've distributed again today, is a roadmap for government-led job creation. By investing in big projects like half a million new public housing homes, free childcare, Australian manufacturing, 100% renewables and high-speed rail and other sustainable infrastructure, instead of bringing forward tax cuts that benefit the wealthy. Our plan would create 870,000 new jobs while tackling the inequality and the climate crises. Our Green New Deal takes its inspiration from FDR's New Deal, where the government was prepared to borrow to invest the country's way out of depression. And it's happened in Australia too. The immediate post-war period coincided with the highest levels of public debt on record. But a full employment strategy was pursued by government-led investment. Within a decade of the shared prosperity that was created, public debt was reduced back to regular levels and economic inequality was lower than at any time before, and sadly, ever since. It is entirely possible to do it again. But this time, the recovery must be pink as well as green. 56% of those who've lost their jobs have been women. 
but the government's recovery is all about business handouts and gas fields. And as we pointed out, opposing the Liberal and Labor two-tiering of JobKeeper, women are twice as likely to be in those low-hours sectors where support is being cut. And there was virtually nothing for women in the budget. The increased responsibilities for unpaid caring during the COVID crisis have been lumped on women, but free childcare has been removed. Now, there are two other essential components. The recovery must also start right now, capable of being expanded today, while also being ready to withstand a second or third wave of the pandemic. In short, the recovery must be green, pink, quick and safe. <laughs> Fortunately, we have at our disposal a means of quickly providing jobs that is low emissions, will employ women, can be rolled out quickly and be, conform, uh, be performed in a COVID compliant way. It's called government. To meet very real community needs and to help get us towards full employment again, the Greens are calling for an expansion of the public and publicly funded not-for-profit sector. With Labor's backing, the government has outsourced the recovery. But right now, the most efficient way of creating jobs to get us out of this economic crater is to directly employ people. We don't need to go through big corporations or hope that money will eventually trickle down. In fact, the best way to get the private sector back on its feet is through public sector investment and lifting demand. If government doesn't step up now, the private sector recovery will take longer. A new approach is needed because on any measure, the last four decades of economic rationalism and trickle-down economics advanced by Liberal and Labor, what goes under the broad heading of neoliberalism, has failed. It has left us more unequal, less able to withstand shocks and teetering on the edge of civilizational collapse. We've been told that the private sector can always do better, but the evidence just doesn't stack up. And the effects have been felt at every stage along this COVID crisis. We've had to rely on the army, the only growing sector of government employment, to do things that public servants once specialised in. This is what happens when you hollow out the public service to the big consulting firms who are even bigger donors. The second outbreak in Victoria was set off because quarantine, security management and contact tracing was privatised and outsourced. COVID was able to spread through workplaces because people either had no right to sick leave or were too scared to ask for time off. Meanwhile, our contact tracing system, as it said, was largely a patchwork of private contracts. Neoliberalism was the vector that spread this virus throughout my home state of Victoria. In aged care, all these neoliberal elements converged. Rampant casualisation forced carers to shuttle back and forth between providers, spreading the virus further and faster. We now have for-profit aged care homes legally obliged to improve profits. And in a sector that by definition is labour intensive, that means cutting costs, which can only come from reducing quality or, and safety or cutting staff. Likewise, high unemployment is great business for private job active providers who get to share in an estimated additional $210 million in payments from the recession. When we cast a longer look back, we can see that in these areas of aged care, employment services, private health, vocational education, contracting out of the public service, as well as in once publicly owned areas like electricity transmission, our essential services have delivered big corporations massive profit at public expense. The Greens estimate that in these six essential service sectors alone, the public has delivered big corporations $10.7 billion in profit. This is profit delivered either in the form of direct subsidies or through laws that let corporations force people to pay higher prices than they otherwise would. And I want here to repeat the crucial point. These aren't big corporations that have made their own way in the private market. They've grown rich by taking money from the public purse. Money that should now go directly to jobs, services and recovery. We also estimate from the budget papers that over the next year, in aged care, private health care, employment services, education, the public service and banking, where we bankroll cheap lending for the big four too big to fail banks, 
the public will be delivering private entities $52 billion to prop up their profits. Add to this the subsidy is going to prop up coal, oil and gas industries, and we see $99 billion a year is being shoveled upwards from everyday people into the pockets of big corporations. This money should be going directly into job creation and service provision, not to the profits of big corporations. It's time to wind back privatisation. The Australian people hate it and it has been a demonstrated failure. It's time to stop putting the big corporations ahead of people, to stop putting the millionaires ahead of the million unemployed. Introduced to Australia by Labor and furthered by the Liberals, neoliberalism has shifted wealth upwards while hollowing out the very public sector that we have relied on to get us through this pandemic. So although we are a party that prides ourselves on non-violence, today we declare war on privatisation. <laughs> We will seek the Senate's support for a wide-ranging inquiry into the failures of privatisation. Given the likely supportive views of the crossbench, we hope we can shame Labor into backing it so that it begins before the end of the year. This will be the first ever comprehensive inquiry into four decades of privatisation, contracting out and deregulating essential and public services. The review will help make the case for bringing some essential services back into public and community hands. It's time to chart a different course where the public comes first and where we put the millions ahead of the millionaires. With a Green New Deal, we can recover from the Great Recession and fight the climate crisis together and set our country up for the 21st century. In the coming months, leading up to what looks like an election year, we'll outline more elements of our Green New Deal. We know that people are increasingly sick of politics as usual and are ready for a fresh approach. We will make the case that the Greens are the only ones who can fix our country's problems because we're the only ones not taking donations from the corporations that are causing our country's problems. 10 years ago, the people of Melbourne elected me for the first time. With the Greens in shared power in the lower house and in the Senate, we used our votes to work with Labor. As a result, 2.7 million children have gone to the dentist with their Medicare card. We saw Australia's pollution drop at the fastest levels ever recorded, while our economy continued to grow. And $13 billion was made available and invested in clean renewable energy through the CEFC and ARENA. Every parliament that I've been elected to, except one, was a tight parliament of a few seat majority, including the current one. Change in seat allocations in Victoria and Western Australia looked to further reduce the coalition's lead going into the next election. But even without these changes, it would take a swing only of less than 1% for two or more seats to fall and we're back in shared power territory. This time around, the Greens will be pushing to leave neoliberalism behind, restore our essential services, pursue full employment, tackle the climate crisis and get the government to invest directly in job creation so that we can have a government, economy and a society that puts the millions ahead of the millionaires. Thank you. Thank you for your speech. Just for the benefit of the wider viewing audience, could you tell us how you got here today? Because you are from Melbourne and uh, the COVID <laughs> restrictions are in place. So I want you to take us through what, how you got here and how you're getting home. Uh, and I also want you to talk about um, uh, the mental capacity of Victorians at the moment and what you're hearing from your electorate the number average that the Premier has set on lifting further restrictions, the five cases in Melbourne per fortnight, it's looking really hard, like they're not going to meet that, and people are getting quite uh, desperate about it. Tell us your fears about that. Do you, do you have fears about that? So um, I needed three permits to get here today, and I've got to be in and out within 24 hours, so drove up here, um, uh, passing through a military and police checkpoint and then come here, uh, stay, turn around straight after this and drive back. 
Uh, so that's, that's the system at the moment. The, um, the other alternative is, of course, to be here for 14 days and leave the family behind in, um, in lockdown under stage four, which for many of us is, just, is, is not an option. The, uh, people are doing it tough. It is tough. And the, uh, I think there is a great sense of um, willingness for the government to succeed. And there are, I, I think, um, uh, probably fair to say the majority of people don't want to see this as being a time for politics, but actually just want to get on top of this wave that we're facing at the moment. And there's a... Uh, everyone tunes in daily to see what the numbers are. And with the numbers being where they are today, there is a sense of um, how much longer can this go on, but there's also a sense of no-one wants to be back here again before Christmas. No-one wants to be doing this forever. So I think um, it's tough... We're all looking out for each other. Everyone wants it uh, over as quickly as we possibly can. And to date, I think people are still willing to, and I certainly am and, and we are, to support restrictions that will help us get over as quickly as possible. It, it appears that we know that the hotel quarantine breakdown in Victoria led to the, the seeding of the virus into the broader community, but that it was also apparent that the contact tracing in Victoria wasn't as good as, say, New South Wales, for example. That has been boosted. Are you confident now that Victoria's contact tracing ability is up to standard? Um, and likewise, a lot of the budget was predicated on there being a, an effective and safe vaccine being rolled out to all of Australians by the end of next year. What happens if that doesn't happen? Is a, is a plan B obvious to you and should we be factoring on that? Look, we have to get um, widespread contact tracing and high levels of testing to be in any kind of position to be able to be talking about lifting restrictions across the country. Um, the, uh, I think it's becoming increasingly apparent that the gutting of uh, the public service and in particular DHHS in Victoria over many, many years that wasn't reversed by um, the current government uh, is now, um, uh, it, it came at a price. And we had a contract tracing system that was, had some had excellent dedicated public servants, but also a mishmash of private contracts being put together in a way that, um, you know, yes, people are doing this all for the first time, but they didn't necessarily have uh, the, the size of a government department that was needed to do it properly. Are we now uh, back at a point where all of those things have been fixed? Don't know. Don't know. And I think it's the big question. And uh, every, many, many people in Victoria have had um, close personal experience of contract tracing not necessarily working as well as they would like. And the, the government, I think, in Victoria has a bit of a way to go to restore trust. But again, people want it to succeed. And I think people would appreciate a boost in the size of and the capacity of DHHS to make sure that um, we can start to lift the restrictions. And the plan B for the broader, the entire nation? Like well, again, I think it depends on, um, we've got to have high levels of contact tracing and high levels right. of testing. Like that's, that's, that's critical for us to be able to start thinking about lifting further restrictions. And are you comfortable with the level of accountability that there has been in Victoria? Uh, I think that the broad sense, which I share, is that people want to get over this and then um, people want to have the discussion about where their heads should roll and at the moment the, and what went on but that led to these decisions and I think at the moment the priority for all of us is to just get out of this and to ensure that we don't have to go back into this situation before Christmas and then you know, over the coming months and in the lead up to the next election we can have the debate about um, who should be a responsibility for it. Okay. Ronald Meisen. Ronald Meisen from the Australian Financial Review. Uh, Mr Bant, you hold the largest block of uh, votes in the Senate outside of the two major parties, yet your ability to secure many of the policies today that you've announced is relatively negligible. It kind of relies on um, the possibility of a, a coalition government in the future with Labor um, or, you know, possible deals on the side. Uh, would, why, why don't you seek to use your block more often um, with the current government um, who you know, have spent the coalition has spent the sort of vast majority of the time in, in government over our, our history to try and give a little bit of what they want and get a little bit of what you want as opposed to a rather op opposition approach? Well, I think, as we've seen with the um, higher education deal that was just done uh, the past through, that uh, deals with this government involve the government getting pretty much everything they want and uh, students, everyone else, the majority of the population suffering as a result of it. 
will be a real alternative to this government. Are we going to roll over just because the government says they don't like what we stand for? No, we're not the Labor Party. Um, we're going to <laughs> offer an alternative position to the government. Um, what we've found, and what I've found over my time of being there, is that when you articulate real alternatives, if they're good ideas, which they are, the government then picks some of them up. And so the levy on the big banks, for example, was something that the Greens proposed and the government picked up. The Banking Royal Commission was something that the Greens pushed for and a Conservative government picked up. Um, the removal of the artificial debt ceiling, something the Greens pushed for and the Conservatives true. picked up. I get, my, my answer to your question is that... Um, and I think and that's what happened with marriage equality as well. Uh, I expect it's what's going to happen with a federal ICAC. My answer to your question is that I've found the more effective way um, is to articulate good policies, um, push them hard, and at the start we might be out there on our own, but then give it a couple of years, then governments pick them up, and even conservative governments in those examples that, that, I've, just, that I've just named. Um, but I guess the real question, the things that matter to us, like tackling inequality and tackling the climate crisis, the Liberals are, uh, uh, have the complete opposite opinion and want to tear down, they, they tore down the carbon price, right? Um, so, you know, are you seriously suggesting that this government, this Liberal government, where George Christensen and Craig Kelly call the shots, are all of a sudden going to wake up tomorrow and want to take some meaningful action on climate change and come to the parliament with a proposal? Like, I don't think they are at the moment. Certainly nothing suggests that, which is why I think, and what I said when I became a leader, that the plan to implement these is to, uh, if the government wants to pick them up and, you know, even a stock clock is right twice a day, then of course we're going to support the government wanting to bring our policies to parliament in the form of legislation. But the plan has got to be um, kick the government out, get the Greens into balance of power, implement a Green New Deal. To get the Greens into government, you'd have to win how many seats? Well, it, um, you'd obviously need to get a majority in Parliament, but, and we've got 10% 10, 10 of the population voting for us at the moment. But you're the, the only lower house Green rep at the moment. Yeah, and we do, uh, but to get the Greens, as I said before, we're, in, we're sitting in a very tight Parliament at the moment, and you have a look at the crossbench, and just put Bob Catter to one side for the moment. Um, <laughs> you have a look at the crossbench that's there in Parliament, and there's Ali Stegall, uh, Helen Haynes. There is a... Like, is Ali Stegall won a seat from a Liberal off the back of climate action. All we need is a shift of one or two seats at the next election, and we're going to be back in that shared power arrangement again. And there is a very real opportunity within a year or so, if that's when uh, Scott Morrison calls the election, that we find ourselves back in a position to have some very real and very serious climate action in this country. Melissa Clark. Melissa Clark from the ABC. Uh, the opposition leader, Anthony Albanese, used uh, his budget reply speech to propose uh, a number of new policies, one of them being the idea of a government corporation that would spend $20 billion enhancing the transmission network to take better account of renewables coming into the network. In lieu of the major parties being anywhere near agreeing on a, a long-term energy policy, would the Greens support uh, an interim focus on improving the transmission network as some movement on energy policy? Well, we took a version of that to the 2019 election. We called for a publicly owned corporation to improve Australia's energy grid. And this goes to that last point about there being no monopoly on good ideas. Sometimes the Liberals pick up our ideas, sometimes Labor does. And um, so when Labor uh, announced on election night that they thought a publicly owned corporation to improve Australia's electricity grid was a good idea, um, I had a look back at our 2019 policy and realised that a lot of it was not copied word for word, but that obviously someone had been doing their homework. Um, the, we could get our country to 100% renewables, and if other parties want to work with us on that, then that would be great, and including having a publicly owned uh, uh, corporation looking at the network. But there was no plan for phasing out coal or gas in Anthony Albanese's speech. Right? If all we do is get Australia running on 100% renewable energy, but then open up the Beedaloo Basin or continue the, let the Adani mine expand and continue to go ahead, you, you wipe out any gains you make from getting Australia running on 100% renewables and you make the climate crisis worse. Right? And so we need to do more than pull in renewables. We need a plan to phase out coal and gas and look after the communities along the way as we do it. So I think there's potentially room to work there on one side of it, but my question to um, Labor would be, especially should we find ourselves in shared power territory after the next election, is what is the plan 
for phasing out coal and gas and looking after the communities along the way. Greg Brown. Greg Brown from The Australian. There's been a lot of talk um, about uh, the Labor Party trying to reconcile its two constituencies, the working class and the social progressives. I think that something that goes um, under the radar is the Greens have two constituencies as well, the hardcore environmentalists and then the very progressive cosmopolitans. So in, in lieu of that, um, something that I think the Greens have hedged on quite a bit um, in recent years is population. And I was hoping for a, a very concise view on, from you on, on this issue. There's nearly 8 billion people on the planet, you know, compared to less than 2 billion 100 years ago. Um, is that too many people? You know, are we getting to the stage where it's, it's the population of the planet is not environmentally sustainable? And for Australia, we're at 25 million people now. You know, do we need to think about a, a lowering of the migration rate, or are you comfortable that we can continue to grow in, a, in an environmentally sustainable way? The big issue is how we produce the energy that we need to survive. No matter what the population size is, the big issue is not how many people there are, it's how they're supported, through what kind of energy. And so to that extent, my answer to your question is that, that my priority is focusing on getting uh, energy, running 100% renewable, and having a plan to get industry switched over from gas to renewably powered electricity. That makes much, much more of a difference than people who argue about population size. I would note that countries with some of the biggest populations sometimes also have the lowest per capita pollution. Mm. The question is... It still affects biodiversity you... levels, though, when we're, we've got to build homes for all the new people um, that are coming into the country. I mean, do you have uh, uh, an idea of the optimum amount of people that, that would be suited to the continent of Australia in an environmentally sustainable way? Well, if we're concerned about environmental sustainability, uh, then what we've got to do is to avoid going over those tipping points that I've mentioned that have us in a climate and environment emergency, we've got to get out of coal, oil and gas in the next 10 years. Mm. Okay? The other debates that are, that are being had um, will become meaningless if we don't have a plan to cut our pollution in accordance with the science. So that's my answer to you. Do you question. have a view on population? Like, it, uh, we've got a um, 160,000... Uh, our cap is 160,000 permanent migrants per year. Is that too many people or is that too few people? We need to lift the humanitarian intake and we've got capacity to do that um, and that should be a big priority. But you've got no view on the permanent, the, the actual migration rate of Australia or the population levels, you've got no view on that? My priority at the moment, if we want to have a sustainable Australia for everyone who lives here, no matter where they come from, is that we have to get this country not only running on 100% renewables, but have a plan to get out of coal, oil and gas. Otherwise, no matter how many people we've got here, um, the carrying capacity of the world stands to halve during my daughter's lifetime. Right? So if you're concerned about people on the planet and people's ability to survive, we've got to get the climate crisis under control. Just picking up off that point, I think the Treasury forecast was, in fact, that there will be uh, a million fewer Australians by 2022 based on what has happened uh, in the last... Um, six, seven months. In your view, is that a good thing? And you've got people like Dick Smith who argue that Australia cannot sustain a big population. Will well, your party look at having a population policy with a firm target? Well, I think what those plans show is that the government had no plan for Australia's economic growth other than increasing population. Like they, they've got no plan to reskill the economy. They've got no plan to reboot manufacturing and have a manufacturing renaissance in this country. They've got no plan to have a construction-led recovery. They were just relying on things continuing as usual. And when there's a hiccup in the way, because the government is just wedded to neoliberalism and has this aversion to direct government investment, they find themselves making these very, very dire forecasts. So um, what I would say it, you know, in response to that is that if you, um, if as a result of these quite correct 
travel restrictions that have been put on as a result of the coronavirus, if that's going to have implications for Australia, then you need an alternative. And at the moment, the government hasn't got one other than to hope. And hope is not a strategy for economic recovery in Australia. That's a politician's answer. Well, it's the, it's the one, one million fewer people by 2022. It's a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it's... It's, from an economic point of view, what it shows is that we need an alternative. You asked before about a plan B, and if now there's going to be a reduction in the number of people who are coming here because of quite correct international border restrictions, then we need an alternative economic plan. And um, neither Labor nor Liberal are putting one forward, and we are. Katina Curtis. Hi. Thanks, Mr Band, for your speech today. Um, I... I was wondering, looking at the budget papers last week, they show uh, payments running higher than receipts for by about 2% of GDP over the next decade, and no, no narrowing in that gap over the next decade. You're talking today about a bigger role for government in, um, in Australia's life, presumably more spending. Do you believe it's important to pay down the debt? The best way to pay down the debt um, is to, and we learned this lesson after World War II, is to invest in things that will grow the parts of the economy that you want to grow and aim for full employment. That way, in 10 years' time, people are going to have good, secure, well-paid jobs and we're going to have something to sell the rest of the world that's not our coal. And that way, we will be a wealthy enough country to be able to get debt levels back down to um, what is considered acceptable. So paying down the, the question is what are we going into debt for and at the moment Liberals with Labor's support have us going into debt to give a tax cut to millionaires. That is not going to help future generations pay down the debt or deal with the crises that they're facing. So to pay, the best way of putting us in a position in a few years time to be able to pay down the debt is to invest now to get back to full employment and to grow those industries. So the answer, my answer to your question is to look, look back at the experience of World War II. Um, as you see from our document, under our plan, we're talking about uh, an increase in net debt of somewhere in the order of about $25 billion a year over the next decade. It would take us to a position where we would still have um, uh, less, substantially less, almost about half, the debt levels of the OECD average. Right? And then we're in a much better position to be able to pay those back over the coming decade because we'll have close to full employment and we'll have things to sell the rest of the world. Paul Karp. Paul Karp from Guardian Australia. Thanks very much for your speech. Last year, Richard Di Natale stood in your position and said that Bill Shorten would be the next Prime Minister, so it was fair enough that the Greens focus on winning the balance of power in the Senate. Today, you've attacked Labor just as much as the Coalition um, for their climate policies. So my question is, what will you do differently at the next election to ensure that the Greens contribute to a change in government rather than just fighting with Labor for the same pool of progressive voters at the risk of re-electing a Conservative government? Well, my main problem with Labor is that they keep voting with the Liberals, right? And that uh, I want to see a bit more fighting Tories and a bit less cuddling Tories, uh, as we saw last week. The government's budget, tax cuts for millionaires, went through because Labor fast-tracked it through, OK? So um, when Labor stops voting with the Liberals, they and starts articulating alternative and helping us take the fight up to the government, we're going to be in a much stronger position to turf out the government. So I guess my... I'll put it back the other way. Like when is Labor going to help us take on this terrible government and stop siding with them? So we will go to the next election making it crystal clear that we want to see this government turfed out. And we'll go to the next election with an alternative to do it. But the big question is going to be, going to that election, is Labor going to provide an alternative on coal and gas and tax cuts for millionaires? So will the Greens do anything differently, electorally? Well, we're going to campaign to win seats. Like, I think that's, as the leader of a party, my job is to campaign for us to increase our vote and win seats. Like, that is the job of, uh, of every political party. But we're also crystal clear that we want to turf the government out. And I think at the last election, we ran a very strong campaign that made it clear the reasons why the government should go. So I think... So I don't agree with your suggestion that somehow... Um, that, that we can't call out Labor when they keep siding with the Liberals. I mean, that, that should be what everyone's doing, shouldn't it? I mean, when last week, as I said in my speech, wasn't a clash of ideas, it was Labor voting with the Liberals to fast-track their package through. Next question is from Tim Shaw. 
Uh, thanks, Sabra. Tim Shaw, Mr Mant, uh, Director of the National Press Club. Thanks so much for your address today. And can I just draw you to your remarks relating to Senator Lydia Thorpe, who was welcome to the, the Federal Senate. She said loud and clear that the priority of restoring relations between our First Nations and settlers has to be a treaty and the recognition of sovereignty that was never given away. And those sentiments echoed certainly by Pat Turner, AM, who delivered the uh, World and Australia Address on behalf of the ANU here only a couple of weeks ago. If we look to the current parliament, we look to Ken, Linda, Pat, Jackie, Mal and Deary, and now Lydia. What role do you see that the Australian Greens political party has, not only at a federal level, but certainly at state and territories, to be able to promote, as Pat Turner has called for, greater uh, pre-selections for Indigenous voices in all of our parliaments? How would you go about that? And what role do the Greens, you're the leader, have now federally to be able to bring all of those excellent Indigenous voices that are already in the parliament together? Yeah, so in... Um um, uh, Victoria, Lydia was pre-selected by the members. We have, we're the only um, progressive party in Victoria at the moment where the members get to vote. Um, mm. And one of the things that they did was vote for Lydia Thorpe to be the next senator, and she won with a very convincing majority. And part of the reason that Lydia was chosen is that when she was in the state parliament, where the Victorian government is, you know, to your point about state parliaments, where the Victorian government is pursuing a treaty, she had, had played a very strong role in strengthening that process to ensure that it was a, a, a bottom-up, clan-based approach to treaties, where it wasn't just one treaty being signed, but one that would have this necessarily, but would have the support from all of the different clan groups, so that it would be something that actually stuck, rather than being a formal document that, yeah. might, that, that might not stick. Um, and that was ultimately, large parts of that were ultimately taken up by the Victorian government. And so now that treaty process is, uh, treaty first process is continuing in um, the Victorian uh, government and the Victorian parliament. Uh, I think there's, there's roles for that to be, happen at the federal level as well. And I think that's what someone like Lydia will do, is to make sure that as we progress down the road towards a treaty, it's a treaty that sticks and it's a treaty that has the support um, of the diverse First Nations communities across Australia. And I think that's one of the benefits of having pre-selected her. Um, and I think it shows that our pre-selection processes work and that people want to see, certainly Greens members, want to see people like Lydia in Parliament. And I think, um, hopefully, that means uh, uh, over coming times and we've got um, uh, an election in Western Australia as well happening, that this is something that, you know, that... that that voters, mem Greens members, get to make their own decisions and they will look at this and be um, making their decisions as well. But certainly Ken Wyatt, as an Indigenous man, now the Minister for uh, Indigenous Australians, not affairs, Australians, what will the Greens do and what can the Greens do, certainly with Senator Thorpe and others, to bring together those voices with the Minister? Well, I think um, Lydia's already started that, and I don't. I, I think I hope at some point that Lydia will get a chance to come here and um, give us give a speech about exactly that issue. And yeah, there was a plug. Thanks for picking that up. Um, yeah. The um, uh, Li Li I know that Lydia's already started that process, and I want to let her speak for herself because she's the chair. But you're the and leader. You support uh, Ken Wyatt in his role. I, yes, I support um, Lydia working that process that you just mentioned of Lydia yeah. working with other Indigenous and First Nations members of Parliament to see if collectively we can reach across party lines to push that process of a treaty? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that has happened, and I know it's happened, and it happens behind the scenes, and part of it happens publicly as well, and that has our support. A second Trump presidency or a Biden presidency, what would be in Australia's interests? And if President Xi tests whoever the new president is in the next six months, as many people suspect he might, with Taiwan, for example, what should Australia do? Um, the, uh, I think Trump has to go. I think it would be much, much better to see Trump go. Um, uh, sadly, Bernie didn't win the nomination, and so I uh, hope then that we see a Biden presidency and that Trump is gone. I think that that would be much more in Australia's interest, in part because, um, in large part, well, there's a number of reasons that we're better for all of us, but one of them, to come <clears throat> to the second point of your question, is that Australian foreign policy has now been caught up in US domestic politics. Mm -hmm. And Australia has been one of the few countries that has cleaved so closely to everything that Donald Trump has done. 
and I think that has been noticed around the world. And uh, the, the, you know, take the question of China, for example. For years during the mining boom, um, the Greens were the only ones in Parliament pointing out issues to do with human rights, pointing out treatment of, um, to, to do with Tibet, um, right, issues to do with political opposition in China. And neither Labor nor Liberal wanted to hear from us because the money was rolling in, right? And we've been making these points for a very long time. Then, when it gets into a re-election year and Donald Trump flicks the switch, all of a sudden, the um, backbenchers from the government start arcing up and all of a sudden profess to have a newfound concern about human rights, whereas, in fact, it had everything to do with Donald Trump being in a re-election year. So uh, what I would like to see is Australia chart a more independent course, um, and I think uh, the, I, I, hope, I hope that if there's a change of government in the United States that we've got the capacity to do that. And, um, but in any event, whoever leads it, but, but especially if Trump is re-elected, something I don't really want to think about, but especially if Trump is re-elected, then we're going to need uh, a re-emphasis on Australia having an independent foreign policy. And if she tests them, how should Australia position itself? Well, again, like Australia uh, can't afford to be dragged in on um, the US's coattails on this. Like, this is ultimately about what is going to advance Australia's security and we should not be uh, Donald Trump's lapdog. And uh, you know, that's a hypothetical question about what would a test look like, but it, Australia has to make a decision in its own interests in that situation, should it occur, and not just a decision because the US has asked us to. Nick Stewart. Talking about making decisions in our own interests, one question that you were asked earlier, which you didn't answer, maybe you didn't hear it, was, what should Australia's population level be? Most environmentalists say that 28 million is absolutely the top at the moment. Uh, we've had a brilliant opportunity now with, the, with COVID to try and scale back on immigration, which has fueled the, the previous economy that you, you've criticised. What would be a number, and is it true that 28 million would be too many Australians? Well, the, the number one... Sorry, yes or no? Well, the, 28 million? I don't think it's a yes or no question. The number that I, the answer that I want to give is this. 30 million. The number that 30, concerns... Do I hear 35? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, oh, you, you go on. Nominate a number. My number is zero pollution. Right? My number is zero pollution. Sorry, I'm if, talking about people, yeah, not pollution. I'm talking about zero pollution because... If you are concerned about no Australian no population number. and our environment being sustainable, then the thing that you've got to be concerned about is the climate and environment emergency that we're facing. Ronald Meisen. Thank you, Sabra. I'm, I'm going to break protocol and go for a double header if, if you'll allow go me. Go for it. We're all going for double headers. Uh, <laughs> you talked about how, uh, when, when I, uh, in answer to my last question, the, uh, the number one thing is to kick the current government out. Um, you've also talked about how you want to pick up more seats. Now, the only way that you can govern, so to speak, is to do so in coalition with Labor. Your policies make it more difficult for Labor to get elected in the seats that they need to pick up. For example, seats in Queensland where your policies around uh, gas and coal um, aren't necessarily received particularly well. Um, do you accept that some of your policies actually make it more difficult to seek the outcome that you are trying to achieve with Labor? And the second question is, if you do get in a situation where you can achieve a coalition government with Labor, what kind of conditions would you put on that and would you make repealing tax cuts um, a condition of a power-sharing arrangement? So, with respect to the first one, I think... Um, by trying to straddle both sides of the street, Labor does a pretty good job of um, making, uh, putting barriers in the way of its electability, right? The, with respect to Queensland, uh, what is, and this is what uh, uh, Queensland Greens are advancing at the moment, is very similar to what I've been putting today. Let's have some government-led plan of investment and action to boost manufacturing and to boost, uh, boost renewables, for example. Um, what uh, uh, had COVID not hit, my plan was to be going to, um, uh, to Queensland and other places as part of our Green New Deal tour. And one of the messages that would have been taking is that um, the, the, the best job for a coal miner is another mining job. Like, we're going to need to expand some sectors of mining in Queensland and in Australia if we are to have a zero carbon society and be selling the rest of the world things that, that are needed in a zero carbon world and a zero pollution world. 
Um, the, uh, the problem with other parties' approach, I mean, the Liberals are, uh, pretend that we can keep on digging up and burning coal forever, and um, what we also know is the Liberals aren't actually friends of coal workers in Queensland. They, um, they are friends of coal corporations in Queensland and actually don't really care about, uh, about workers. What is needed is a plausible, believable jobs plan for workers and communities in these sectors. Now, I mean, one of the, uh, I'm probably the only Greens MP that's got a picture of a coal-fired power station hanging on their wall. Um, I've got it there because it was a gift from the coal miners and power station workers union when I was representing them, negotiating their agreement um, in the, in the uh, first agreement after privatisation. Right? And it was a thank you gift for helping maintain some of their wages and conditions. I know that we've got to have a plausible, believable jobs plan that may involve jobs in renewables, but may involve jobs in other areas. Let's strengthen the transmission lines through a publicly owned um, energy corporation. Uh, let's invest in manufacturing and give people manufacturing jobs. I know the need to have a plausible jobs plan um, that people can understand, not something off in the future, but something very plausible. And I think Labor didn't take one <coughs> to those sections of Queensland at the last election. And we did, and we will. And um, that's, I think, is going to mark one of the things that I'm going to be focused on as leader, is a plausible, believable jobs plan, um, including for people in Queensland, that has government investment at its core. And second question. Sorry, remind, second me, question. remind me of the second question. Uh, it, Tax potential um, requirements for a power sharing arrangement. Yeah, this, we'll put our whole platform on the table should we find ourselves in that situation. And so we're talking about a big build of um, half a million new public housing homes. We're talking about winding back uh, subsidies for billionaires and big corporations. We're talking about some serious climate action. We're talking about getting dental all the way into Medicare. We got it into Medicare for Kids in the last power sharing parliament and we want to finish that off. And we're talking about free childcare and free education. But those are going to be the elements. We'll put our whole platform uh, on the table as part of any discussions. What about a serious ICAC with teeth? Look, we could have that when Parliament resumes. Um, we've, we've got... Uh, if there's one thing that this week shows, you know, understand why people are sick of politics, right? And if you think that corruption stops at state level and stops at the ACT border and doesn't happen up here, then I've got a bridge to sell you, right? We need a federal corruption watchdog with teeth. And the Greens have got a bill that has passed the Senate, right? It actually passed the Senate. It's in the House of Reps at the moment. The government could bring it on next week and pass it, right? And this idea of the government at the moment that it's too busy dealing with the pandemic and can't have an anti-corruption commission is one that does not wash. Like, if they're so busy, they're so, they're so busy dealing with the pandemic that they had time to pass laws to allow backdoor political donations to be funneled through state parties up to federal parties, but not to pass an anti-corruption commission? I mean, seriously, right? We should have a national watchdog with teeth. And yes, if we, we've been the first ones to push it, I introduced the first bill for a national watchdog, anti-corruption watchdog into the House of Representatives. And if we're in a position um, as part of some uh, 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 power sharing arrangement, then yes, we'd like to see that as well. Melissa Clark. Melissa from ABC again. Uh, I'd like to ask you about the EPBC Act. Uh, the government has rammed through the lower house its uh, efforts mm -hmm. to introduce a, a partial element of the Sims recommendations around it. Uh, can I ask you about uh, the upper house? Are you working with the crossbench to try to raise with them your concerns and convince them of that as well? And if you are successful in uh, preventing the, the partial change from going through, what is the best way forward beyond that to improving Australia's environmental protection regime? Is it trying to convince the government to more fully bring together a, a single body that would bring about the, the recommendations of the Sims report? or? would you want to wait until there was a different government in charge to try and make more wholesale change to environmental protection? We are working to try and get the other uh, crossbenchers and other parties in Parliament to stop this legislation passing. And to date, we've had some success. We'd like, success. We'd like to see a thorough review of the legislation and inquiry into the legislation, and that's something that needs to happen. The, um, the Samuels review has... Uh, sorry, Samuel. Some, some other, Sim, sorry. Some, yeah, yes. yeah, some, has has some other elements to it as well, and, and 
that has been calling for a, um, a, a watch, a, a, an enforcement agency with teeth, like a proper cop on the beat, OK? And that would be a good idea. There's also, implicit in all of that was that review process was the need for strong national standards. Now, um, the government needs to go back to the drawing board and come up with a bill that includes strong national standards and a cop on the beat. And um, if the government was interested in doing that, then of course we'd assess it on the, its merits. The government, the government has, hasn't done that. The government has said it supports the idea of national environmental standards and they see that as the next stage in legislation. So if they were to unite those parts of legislation, would that be enough to garner the green support? Well, that's what, what's what we're calling for. We're calling for one bill that includes uh, cop on the beat and strong national standards. And uh, only once you've got that in place could you have a discussion about other things, such as like, how to deal with states and so on. We don't have any of that. And, um, uh, and I think the fact that the government has deliberately chosen to not include those things, but just inc instead include only the handover to states and, um, uh, and then just say, trust us on the rest of it. I'm sorry, I don't trust them. Everybody, please join me in thanking the leader of the Australian Greens, Adam Bant.